Please welcome our speaker for the morning, a planetary scientist at JPL since 1977. <clears throat> Dr. Linda Spilker is Cassini Project Scientist, Research Fellow, and Senior Research Scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She earned her PhD summa cum laude in geophysics and space physics <clears throat> from UCLA in 1992 and has participated in NASA's planetary missions for over four decades, beginning with 12 years work on the Voyager mission. During those four, four decades, her roles have grown to encompass mission leadership, as well as mission design, planning and operation. As Cassini project scientist, Dr. Spilker led a team of 300 international scientists responsible for data analysis. She has worked on the Cassini mission for more than 30 years, has authored dozens of scientific studies and has received more than 20 professional awards. And as we will hear, Dr. Bilker is still working on the Cassini mission. She and a team of others continue to make discoveries in the data that Cassini collected during its 20 years in space. So we'll take questions at the end of the presentation. For that reason, right now, I'll ask everyone to turn off their microphones. And during the program, if you wish, you can type questions into the chat and we'll get to them during the Q&A session at the end. Dr. Spilter, again, welcome to the Greenway Talks online at Palomar Observatory. So the Cassini mission has not ended. Well, please tell us about it. Please tell us about its discoveries and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, yes, as Stephen said, I've been the Cassini project scientist, and I think analysis of the Cassini data will probably continue for decades to come. That there was such a fire hose of data when the, as the mission was going on, that what we did is we've got just skimmed the cream off of those data and are continuing to uh, look at those data and also to publish papers. So it, it's a very exciting time that way. As uh, Stephen said, I'm the Cassini Project Scientist, and in the last year, I've actually transitioned back to Voyager. Uh, the Voyager mission launched the same year I started at JPL in 1977. And now that my Cassini duties are pretty much done, I've gone back to work on Voyager as Voyager has crossed the heliopause and is now in exploring interstellar space. I'd like to talk about surprises in the Saturn system, and there were many discoveries made that really shifted the paradigm of how we look at the planets and in particular their moons and then to give you updates uh, on those Cassini discoveries. Uh, what you can see in the background here is the Andromeda galaxy and there are a lot of similarities between the spiral arms and galaxies and the rings at Saturn and I'll get into more detail about that a little bit later in the talk. Let's see it's not letting me I'm sorry, Dr. Spilker, what, what, what do you need? Yeah, it's not, I'm not sure. Let me try that again. Um, let me go out of presentation mode and, and try it. Uh, let me open the file back up and try that. Okay. Um, I'll try I, presentation mode again, and we'll see if it doesn't let me uh, change slides. We might have to go to a different mode. Okay. Oh, good. There. This is one of my uh, favorite images. I use it as my background image. It was a rare opportunity in Cassini's trajectory where Saturn is actually eclipsing the sun. And this allowed us to turn our instruments, our remote sensing instruments in at very high phase angles and put together this mosaic of images. 
You can see Saturn's rings, and in particular, the outermost E ring made primarily of very small particles uh, glowing at these very high phase angles. And uh, I'll talk more about this image a little bit later in the talk, but in particular, I really like the fact that if you see the white ring around the disk of Saturn, uh, that sunlight refracted through the atmosphere, and you're seeing every sunrise and sunset on Saturn at the same time. Well, often the question comes up, why do we explore the planets? Why do we go out and want to know more about the world in our solar system? And one of those has to do with the grand science questions put together in the Planetary Science Decadal Survey. One of those is, are we alone in the universe? Has life originated somewhere other than the Earth? And how did life originate on our own planet? Another grand science question is how did the solar system and the earth within it come to be? How is it evolving and where is it headed? And Saturn is the sixth planet out from the sun. It's one of the gas giant planets. It's the second largest planet in our solar system. And you can also see the two ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. And in NASA's most recent decadal, they've approved a flagship mission like Cassini to go out and explore and orbit the planet Uranus. Well, how big is Saturn? Here, the Earth and the Moon are shown to scale, and here is Saturn to scale as well. So Saturn truly is a giant planet in our solar system. And also, if you compare the size of Saturn to some of the low mass stars, you can see it's within the range. So it's Jupiter is shown here, and everything is scaled to one Jupiter radius and one Jupiter mass. You can see that Saturn is 83% of Jupiter's radius and 30% of Jupiter's mass, and is very similar in radius to some of the low mass stars uh, that are in uh, our nearby neighborhood. Also seem to have gotten stuck again. Let me stop sharing. Um, try and share my screen again. I'll, we'll see if it'll allow me to go forward. Not sure why. I think this may be a problem with Zoom. Okay, there. This is a view of the Cassini orbiter provided by NASA, and the European Space Agency provided uh, the Huygens probe. And you can see the Huygens probe mounted on the Cassini orbiter. Uh, there's a high gain antenna at the top. We use that to return the, the signals to the Earth and also used it for science on board Cassini. Uh, for scale, Cassini is about the size of a three-story building. You can see people in both of these images to give you an idea of the size of the Cassini spacecraft. Uh, Cassini is powered by three radioisotope thermoelectric generators using the decay of plutonium and the heat from that decay to generate power uh, for the Cassini spacecraft. So as the mission progressed from launch through the end of the mission, we had a little bit less power each year but it was sufficient to continue to operate the instruments. And we did have to do some power sharing with those. I can see that gold foil is covering the Cassini spacecraft and the Huygens probe. And this is because Cassini did not take a direct trajectory to Saturn, but rather had uh, Venus flyby, two Venus flybys, an Earth flyby, and then on out to Jupiter. And so that gold, those gold thermal blankets actually provided protection in at the distance of Venus. And uh, here I am with one of my daughters uh, early in the mission uh, before Cassini had launched. And we actually had a chance to go in and put on our little bunny suits and go through the air shower and actually uh, see the Cassini spacecraft uh, right before it was shipped off to the Cape. Here are the 12 science instruments on board Cassini with many more experiments. There are four optical remote sensing instruments. They're mounted on their own pallet. And it turns out that Cassini did not have a scan platform. So in order to point the instruments, had to turn the whole spacecraft at the same time. So we looked at the uh, from the ultraviolet through the far infrared, had both a narrow and wide angle camera on board Cassini with a series of fil uh, filters on individual filter wheels. The high gain antenna was used for microwave remote sensing, both for a radar experiment, in particular put on board Cassini to probe through the atmosphere of Saturn's moon Titan and also a radio science subsystem to probe the atmosphere and the rings, the atmosphere of Saturn and Titan, and to make measurements of the rings themselves. A series of six fields and particles instruments, including magnetometer, uh, plasma wave spectrometer instruments that basically measure the protons, electrons, ions, 
and the particles in the environment around the Cassini spacecraft. This is an overview of the Cassini-Huygens mission shown against the backdrop of Saturn's 30-year orbit around Saturn. Uh, Cassini was in orbit around Saturn for almost two seasons, arriving in 2004 at a four-year prime mission, followed by a two-year equinox mission where the rings were edge on to the sun. And then the goal was to last through uh, summer, northern summer solstice, a series of what we call proximal or grand finale orbits at the end where at the very last orbits, Cassini actually dove in between the innermost ring and the atmosphere and the, the planet itself, and then ending the mission by going into the atmosphere of Saturn. This is a pictorial overview of the mission. At the top, you can see a view of the orbits we, uh, that occurred with Cassini in each year of the mission and the number of orbits. Uh, we used Titan as our tour driver, 127 flybys of Titan. Titan's about the size of the planet Mercury, and so very effective in providing gravitational assists to shape the size and orientation of Cassini's orbits. We could go to high inclinations, we could go to more distant orbits, more close in orbits. And it was actually a Titan flyby that sent Cassini into the gap between Saturn and the rings at the end of the mission. Initially in the prime mission, we had three close flybys of Enceladus and a number of the other icy moons, but Enceladus was so intriguing that we've actually added another 20 close Enceladus flybys before the end of the mission, especially to probe the plume of material emanating from the south pole of Enceladus. And total had an additional 15 flybys, close flybys of the other icy satellites. And then you can see the 22 proximal orbits in the last few months of the mission. One thing a Cassini mission could do is watch as the seasons changed on Saturn. And in a sense, the ring shadow on the planet serves as a sundial on Saturn. We arrived at uh, just after Northern winter solstice. You can see the ring shadow in the North. Uh, the middle view is equinox where the ring shadow is essentially a very thin line right at the equator. And toward the end of the mission, Northern summer solstice, this is a view of the South pole of Saturn, you can see the ring shadow uh, is very deep into the south polar region. One of the surprises we found is that the ring shadow covered up enough of the planet that, that gold, the golden hazy particles that are created by the interaction with sunlight essentially were no, no longer created. We got to see deeper into the atmosphere and see a bluish color rather reminiscent of Uranus and Neptune. And over the course of the mission, we came to understand that these were just changes in the development of the haze particles. One of Cassini's studies were of the giant hexagon. It's a six-sided jet stream that's at the North Pole of Saturn. Uh, this jet stream is a very effective barrier uh, between the atmosphere inside the hexagon and outside of it. And so inside of the hexagon, you can actually see some of that bluish color as the sunlight has not spent much time yet in the Northern Polar region. And at the very center is a hurricane that uh, hexagon is about two Earth diameters across. Here's a movie of the hexagon. You can see that in, in false color, you can see the hurricane at the center. And as studies have continued, we've tried to model uh, this hexagon. And what's really intriguing is its stability, uh, first seen by Voyager in the early 1980s, uh, still there and really unchanged uh, with the Cassini flyby. It appears to be, with more study, a sinusoidal oscillation that's fixed in a very narrow latitude range. And uh, sometimes these structures, five-sided, six-sided, can be generated in rotating fluids uh, within the lab. And so it's a, it's a very intriguing feature. It's the only hexagonal feature of this size and shape. There's only at the North Pole of Saturn. There's not one at the South Pole. And looking more closely at the hurricane at the center, Hurricane spans about half the distance of the continental United States. Wind speeds several times a typical Earth hurricane. It's also very long lived, sitting right at the North Pole. Sunlight is coming in from the right, and you can actually see the shadow of the eye wall in this hurricane. A little bit more information about the hurricane. You can see it's about 2,000 kilometers across. Uh, the image on the left is in the from the visual and infrared mapping spectrometer or the red color is indicating a very clear atmosphere. This appears to be a region of subsidence at the North Pole. A few greenish clouds 
sensitive to ammonia ice absorption. The blue is the high level haze uh, that's surrounding uh, this hurricane and the black, you can see a black cloud at the very center and that black opaque cloud is a very clear region going deep into the planet. Looking in with a different instrument, the composite infrared spectrometer, uh, look at the temperature map of this region. I uh, can see it's about 10 degrees Kelvin warmer uh, around the hurricane compared to the surrounding region. And this is another evidence of subsidence within this vortex. Some of the Saturn science highlights, uh, many analogies to Earth's weather. Uh, we can study that we also saw a giant storm in 2010 that completely encircled that latitude band in the northern hemisphere. The giant hurricanes at both poles, you can see snapshots of those. First complete view of the North Polar Hexagon, uh, that jet stream that's in place there as clouds race around the edge of the hexagon. And actually we're able to measure Saturn's rotation rate using waves in the rings. And I'll get to that uh, in the section about the rings, but that was a surprise. It turns out that the rotation axis and the magnetic field axis are essentially co-aligned. And so it's not possible uh, to get the rotation of the interior of the planet using that method. Here are Saturn's rings, very simple names, A, B, and C rings, innermost D ring, uh, jumping out to the E ring, then the F ring, and finally the G ring. And the rings are simply named in the order in which they were discovered. Here's a beautiful uh, color view of the rings taken by Cassini. Uh, the B ring is the most optically thick and contains by far the most mass of the ring system. The A ring has less mass, the C ring even less, and a very tenuous D ring as particles from the edge of the D ring fall into the atmosphere of Saturn. I can see the Cassini division. Uh, the Cassini mission was named after uh, the astronomer who discovered the Cassini mission. And there's also the Enki gap present there. And in each of these gaps, there are tiny moons that orbit inside of them, uh, keeping these gaps open. And this was our best highest resolution views with the cameras. We also had hundreds of stellar and radio occultations uh, that we could use to probe the rings. Here's Saturn's rings at equinox. Occurs about, it occurs about once every 15 years. We've actually had to brighten the rings by about a factor of 30 on the left and about a factor of 60 on the right to even be visible because the rings became very dark. Uh, with the exception of the F ring, it has a slight inclination relative to the equatorial plane of Saturn. And so it remained bright in this image. Mm. And with these ring shadows, what we're doing is we're looking for any structures that stand up above and below the rings. The rings are on average only a few meters to maybe paper thin. So any larger ring particles or larger objects that stick above or below uh, this 10 meter thick ring would cast shadows. And another one of my favorite images, this is the outer edge of the B ring. You can see into the Cassini division. And at the outer edge of the B ring, we see larger ring particles, possibly ring clumps, one to, two to three kilometers in diameter, casting large shadows, you know, those spiky shadows on the rings. And a good analogy would be if you were in the uh, space station looking down, trying to see the pyramids. Uh, if you look around noon, those pyramids would blend in. It would be difficult to spot them from the space station. But if you look at dawn or dusk, equivalent to this equinox view, uh, you would be much more likely to see their large shadows. And then in the same way, we looked at different places in the rings. Here it was the most dramatic. There were other places in the rings where we saw shadows for larger material, but this is clearly uh, evidence of the ring particles crowded right at the edge of the B ring. It's held in place by a resonance with Saturn's moon Mimas, a two to one resonance, and the particles uh, don't go any further into the Cassini division at this point, but cast very intriguing shadows. These are some of the other objects that cost, cast shadows during equinox. Uh, they got a nickname of propellers uh, because they have two arms to them. There are some of the larger ring particles, perhaps clumps of ring particles that are trying to open gaps in the rings. And you can think of those two arms of the propellers are the gaps that they're trying to open. And, you can, and they were named after some famous area aviators. You can see Blerio, Santos Dumont, Earhart, Earhart for Amelia Earhart. And the bottom right image just shows circles of a number of propellers. They appear to come in belts 
within Saturn's A-ring and perhaps a larger object was broken apart and you're seeing the shards or fragments of that parent object that form this belt here in the A-ring. And we've been studying these propellers because it's intriguing because the Saturn's rings disk itself is a good analogy for the disk of material from which planets might form. So by looking at interactions such as how propellers move within the rings and how material accumulates, uh, we get a better understanding of perhaps how the planets formed within our own solar system. So modeling continues to understand especially the motion of the propellers. Here they are some of the largest objects in this disk of material. And yet sometimes they tended to drift inward, sometimes outward uh, within the A-ring. We also watched to a clump of material, which was an indication of a very large object right at the outer edge of Saturn's A-ring. It created a bright feature of material about 1200 kilometers long, discovered in April 2013. And this object was nicknamed Peggy. Turns out that the uh, individual, the scientist who discovered it, discovered it on his mother-in-law's birthday, and her name was Peggy. So he decided to nickname it in her honor. And Cassini, with Cassini's cameras, we continued to watch over the course of the mission to see if Peggy might break free and form a moonlet in her own right. Uh, that one of the theories is that perhaps some of the moons in the Saturn system, in particular, some of the smaller moons, uh, certainly not Titan, but some of the smaller moons may have formed from material that is cast off from the rings and then comes together and clumps. And so there's still ongoing work to see if we could better understand how perhaps the rings actually contribute to the moons in the Saturn system. As I alluded to at the beginning of the talk, the wave structure in Saturn's rings is governed by the same physics that governs the spiral galaxies. If you think of taking the arms of a spiral and wrapping it up very, very, very tightly, uh, then you can actually imagine what waves might look like in Saturn's rings. And here's a picture of two of those types of waves, a bending wave and a density wave, a bending wave typically created by resonances with the moon Mimas, which also has a slight inclination relative to Saturn's equatorial plane. Mimas's resonance actually lifts material above and below the ring plane by about a kilometer or two and creates the wave that you see on the left. Uh, the waves that you see on the right, there's actually uh, several of them, are uh, in-plane horizontal waves created by particles clumping together and then a rarefication and clumping together. Imagine those tightly wrapped arms of spirals. And so these are created by the resonances uh, within Saturn's rings. And there are dozens of them throughout the rings. And by studying their damping patterns, we get an idea of what the, the density of material is within the rings and it actually changes. We can see the change in density even within the A-ring, the outermost A-ring itself. And also in between these waves, there's some intriguing structure. You can see what looks like a regularly spaced pattern of bright and dark in between these waves. And so there are lots of puzzles left in Saturn's rings in trying to understand what creates the structure down to the resolution of our occultations, which was on the order of just a few meters, uh, down to a few meters resolution. So it's really amazing uh, to look at these structures. I talked earlier about some of these waves that we saw in the rings that were not density waves or spiral bending waves. And instead, those waves track back to actually the oscillations of Saturn. Saturn is a huge gas ball. It doesn't have a solid surface. It maybe has a small uh, core the size of several Earths. But this gaseous planet is actually oscillating. You can think of it as ringing in various modes. And you can see some of the modes shown here. You've got an M equals four mode on the left, uh, basically several M equals three, as well as several M equals two modes. And so by, we looked at these modes and could predict where they would be located and actually look for and found dozens of these waves of different modes in the rings. And so that's very intriguing. And so here's how we actually got Saturn's spin, spin period by looking at a number of those waves shown as those black curves and then looking for the best fit. You can see the distribution of the expected periods for the Saturn F mode waves. Uh, you can resulting in a period for the best fit of about 10 and a half hours, 10 hours, 35 minutes uh, for the rotation period for the internal rates for Saturn. And you can see that there were predictions from other 
types of measurements. Uh, in the orange arrow, you can see the Voyager uh, Saturn kilometric radiation predicted an interior rotation rate. Uh, Cassini's SKR had a very different rate, which led us to know that uh, the Saturn kilometric radiation was generated not from the interior of Saturn, but actually from the auroral regions at the poles of the planet. Uh, gravity field modeling, wind analysis from what we could see on the surface, and all have their different periods. And so the, the best fit from looking at these waves, this ring seismology, is about 10 hours, almost 10 hours, 36 minutes. Here's that beautiful view of Saturn, again, Saturn occulting the sun. And so we had a period of time to take pictures uh, with the cameras and create also with all of the instruments making measurements and all of the different wavelengths to understand and try and um, better know about what these small icy particles are doing. But now not only do we have this image, but it turns out there were three planets, including the Earth and the Moon system. We spent about 20 minutes uh, taking a series of color images of the Earth and the Moon. We use this as an outreach event and ask people to actually send us pictures of themselves uh, waving at, at uh, the Earth, at, we're waving at Saturn from the Earth during this 20 minute window. And it turns out that one of the opportunities we had with Cassini was actually to take images of all of the planets, uh, pretty much with the exception of Mercury in our solar system. Mercury was just too close to the sun. And we use this to look at, in particular, Uranus and Neptune to think about exoplanets. That exoplanets, a number of them fall in the same range as uh, in size of Uranus and Neptune, so that we looked at these planets at different phase angles uh, to help us understand exoplanets themselves. And we actually got a snapshot of Pluto shown at the bottom far right. So some of the highlights of the ring science, the rings are actually an active dynamic laboratory that we can use to study how planets might have formed. See tiny moons that orbit in the ring gaps, uh, shadows form large ring vertical structures, and the discovery of kilometer-sized objects called propellers. The ring particles clump together throughout the rings. You can see evidence of ring clumping, and the rings might, might be young with ages between perhaps 10 and 100 million years. Well, Cassini actually provided some information about our own heliosphere. This is the bubble created by the solar wind when the solar wind runs into the interstellar medium. And then there's this boundary called the heliopause. And you can see on the right, the old view of what we thought our heliosphere looked like. It was rather comet-like with the nose as we travel through interstellar space with a long extended tail. Instead, the new view from Cassini and from also looking at Ibex data is that the heliosphere is more like a bubble. It may have some shape in the tail region, uh, some thought that maybe it's more like a croissant instead, but it clearly is a different shape from what the, we originally thought. And Cassini's energetic neutral analyzer actually provided data in mapping out the heliosphere that led to uh, some of the measurements about its shape. So uh, Cassini actually looked beyond the Saturn system and looked out at our own heliosphere. And both voyagers are now outside the heliosphere, uh, actually went through the termination shock, the heliosheath and the heliopause and provided additional information about this very important bubble that is protecting the earth and the planets from about 80% of the high energy galactic cosmic rays. Some of the highlights from the magnetosphere, discovery of heavy, heavy positive and negative ions in Titan's ionosphere, uh, the first in situ measurements of Saturn's top side ionosphere, uh, found a, a nano dust between Saturn and the D ring, uh, discovery of Enceladus plumes and their interaction with the magnetosphere, and the discovery of the shape of the outer heliosphere. Here are some of the inner planets in our solar system. And as I mentioned, uh, Titan is about the size of the planet Mercury. They range from look, what looks like tiny shards of material all the way out to giant Titan. Titan is the only moon in our atmosphere with a thick, dense atmosphere. Uh, Ganymede, which is slightly larger than Titan, Ganymede, Jupiter's moon, does not have an atmosphere, even though it's larger in size. So Titan is a very interesting and intriguing world. Here's a view of some of those uh, tiny moons. Some of them are very smooth in appearance. Some are heavily cratered. 
uh, different processes going on in these moons and Prometheus in particular actually has a skirt of ring material. It orbits, or, orbits near the F ring and is actually accumulating ring particles right at its equator. As I mentioned, uh, there are actually moons that orbit within the gaps in Saturn's rings. Uh, Pan orbits in the Enki gap. We found Daphnis in the Keeler gap. And uh, there are pictures of those. You can see these skirts or uh, edges of accumulated ring particles. They accumulate out to what's called the Roche lobe at that point. The balance between Saturn's gravity and the, the gravity provided by the tiny moon is such that particles, no, can, it can no longer grow in size for that particular skirt. And these moons are actually rubble piles of material, perhaps with apparent shard of icy material, and then have accumulated particles uh, around their surface. So densities are very low, maybe only 0.4 or 0.5 grams per cubic centimeter, where you can take water ice at one gram per cubic centimeter. Here's a view of Daphnis. A Daphnis is actually creating a wave along the inner edge of the uh, Keeler gap, and you can see it actually, the wave would be on the other side, but you just don't see it in this particular image. And looking more closely, you can see that Daphnis actually pulls little ribbons of material off the edge of the ring, and you can think of these waves along the rings almost like waves along a beach, uh, damping out as it, the particles race ahead of Daphnis. And you see a graininess in that image. That graininess is created by the ring particles clumping together. It's not an artifact of the cameras, but it actually is a process that's happening in Saturn's rings. A moon further out in the Saturn system is Iapetus. Uh, one of the early discoveries of Cassini is that Iapetus has a mountain chain that completely encircles its equatorial region, about 2,000 kilometers in size, with ridges in some places over 20 kilometers high. And it's the possible decay of a ring that might have orbited around Iapetus. And we now know that there are other objects in our solar system, such as Chiriklo, that actually have ring systems orbiting about them. Some of the icy satellite highlights uh, detected uh, ocean, global oceans between Enceladus and possibly Dione and Mimas' crust. I'll get into a little bit more about Enceladus shortly. Some intriguing red streaks were found on Tethys and then this false color image, uh, potentially signifying maybe outgassing along fractures. Uh, we just didn't get close enough to get high resolution of these and composition measurements of what these streaks might be, but they appear in some of the closest images to almost be painted on the surface, and we're not sure what it, their sources might be. So all these accretion disks or skirts of material around Saturn's moons, in particular da Atlas, Daphnis, and Pan, and that they continue to add ring particles only up to a certain limit. We solved the mystery of the dual dark bright surface on Iapetus. It turns out that Phoebe dust is uh, Phoebe dust and outermost perhaps captured KBO is providing the material that's coating Iapetus's dark side. And there's the uh, globe encircling equatorial ridge. A little bit about Titan. Titan has a thick atmosphere. Uh, Voyager was unable to penetrate through to see what the surface of Titan might look like. And it was the Voyager flybys of Titan in the early 1980s that motivated the Cassini mission to go back to Titan to carry the Huygens probe to look in more detail at that atmosphere. And so the Huygens probe was released from Cassini on December 25th, and about three weeks later arrived at Titan, uh, entered the atmosphere and first encountered about 1,270 kilometers altitude. The first parachute came out about 156 kilometers. Then the main parachute on the main parachute for about 15 minutes at about 155 kilometers. Then a smaller drogue chute was released starting at about 125 kilometers. And the chute was smaller because the atmosphere was dense enough. We wanted to be sure to reach the surface before the batteries on board Huygens uh, would cease to operate. Impacted about five meters per second. The impact was uh, small enough that Huygens actually continued to operate for quite some time. And the data were returned as Cassini flew overhead. And so Cassini collected those data and then turned back to Earth and sent those data back to Earth. So there were two hours, 28 minutes during the descent and an hour and 12 minutes on the surface. Uh, the signal, once Cassini had flown by overhead, was still received by a radio telescopes uh, for up to five hours, 42 minutes. Uh, that 
the Huygens probe was alive and well on the surface. Ooh. Here's a movie of that descent. Uh, you can see that the, as the probe was rotating, we were uh, putting together this movie. I uh, can see it had actually pierced through the haze now, uh, getting closer to the surface. It's a little bit hazy there, but the, then landing in what we think was probably a dry stream bed. And here's an image uh, from that surface. So we could see rounded icy pebbles. That one in the foreground, we perhaps maybe tipped up with the Huygens probe as it landed. Actually watch the, the, the shadow of the parachute, <coughs> excuse me, in the image as we, as we continued to watch Huygens. Here are the Huygens images and uh, just shown. Uh, so we actually carried a light. If you look at the second image in color, compared a lamp that actually shown on the surface so that we could get the correct colors and use that as a calibration for our images and just show what we're seeing that would be comparable to that uh, view on the moon at a smaller scale. You can see the astronaut's footprint and then the astronaut and the flag in the distance. As we were coming down, we actually saw a network of channels flowing and indicating that liquid was flowing on the surface of Titan. Turns out that uh, methane plays the role that water plays here on the Earth. Methane could form clouds, could rain from those clouds to actually flow through river channels, and could actually be in the form of ice. So it's at the triple point of methane. The Huygens probe was actually warm when it landed compared to the surface. And what you're seeing on these plots on the left is that the mole fraction is a function of time. The dashed vertical line is indicating when Huygens impacted the surface. And from there, you can see the increase in the emission of uh, methane. The middle one is ethane and then acetylene. As the Huygens probe was sitting on the surface, we had a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer and the arrow indicates its inlet and it continued to send back measurements as Cassini flew overhead. This is the cycle, the methane cycle that's present on, on the surface of Titan. So precipitation, liquid hydrocarbons, possible cryovolcanism. We know that methane is destroyed in the upper atmosphere to form more complex hydrocarbons. And so the methane needs to be replenished or on the, the timescales of the solar system, uh, the methane would be gone. And then that greenhouse effect would collapse the atmosphere. So a summary of Titan, lakes and seas, there are dunes in the equatorial region, those particles that grow in the upper atmosphere actually fall down and form dunes in the equatorial region, mountains that are per perhaps cryovolcanic, uh, methane cloud, dry riverbeds, uh, and dry riverbeds. And what's interesting is these lakes and seas are primarily at the North Pole of Titan, and you can see the river channels flowing into them. They're primarily methane uh, with some ethane. Titan highlights the Huygens probe, of course, making the first landing on a moon in the outer solar system. Titan is revealed as an Earth-like world with rain, rivers, dunes, lakes, and seas. Discovered a variety of weather patterns on Titan. Prebiotic chemistry is uh, possible on Titan. We wonder if with the methane as a liquid, uh, could we perhaps have some kind of exotic life that could exist in the seas on Titan? Uh, discovered also a dense salty global ocean of liquid water that's below a thick icy crust and a relatively low density core. Hmm. Finally, I want to finish up with Enceladus. Enceladus is much smaller than our own moon. Uh, what's shown here is the Earth, the moon, and then Enceladus to scale. Enceladus is only about 500 kilometers in diameter. Here's a view of Enceladus, and what we saw were four distinct blue fractures nicknamed tiger stripes at the south pole of Titan. And I would note this is something that was missed by Voyager and the flybys in the 1980s, in part because of the seasons. At that time, the south pole of Enceladus was in darkness. And uh, so we didn't have the opportunity to see the tiger stripes, which might have given us some pause and shaped what instruments we carried on board the Cassini spacecraft. One of the early measurements of Enceladus, one of the first things we saw is there was an excess of heat at the south pole of Enceladus. And in future flybys found that that excess of heat was actually along these four tiger stripe features. Here's a view of the tiger stripes about 130 kilometers long. They have flanking ridges over hundred meters tall, two to four kilometers wide. 
And you can actually see what looks like icy edges on these tiger stripes. And then discovering jets and plumes, there was an indication of those from the magnetometer data and actually encouraged us to go closer in one of our flybys. And you can see those uh, jets, over 100 of them, coming out from the south polar region of Titan or of Enceladus. And Cassini was actually able to fly through these seven times and actually make measurements of the gas and of the icy particles and make direct composition measurements of those. Here are some of the organics found in the plume, basically organics all the way up to the resolution of the ion and neutral mass spectrometer, coarse sea water, but also methane and ammonia compounds, carbon dioxide, argon, and a whole host of organics all the way up to the C6 compounds. Also found sodium and potassium concentrated in some of the larger ice grains. Uh, we now know that Enceladus has a global ocean uh, surrounding a rocky core. Turns out that there was an excess of libration as Enceladus orbited, and the only way to explain that was to separate with a, with a global ocean. And that the frozen seawater uh, has a pH and a concentration very comparable to Earth's ocean. We think that coming from that ocean, there are vents that are, these are the vents that create the jets that gas and icy grains come out and these icy particles and material go on. And some of those actually go on and form the E-ring. You can see that the jets of material coming out from, you can see Enceladus is a tiny black dot. You can see the plume of material and then the E-ring that spreads in, it spreads inward toward Saturn, outward toward Titan. And many of the satellites are coated uh, on one side with these E-ring particles. We also think that there might be hydrothermal vents on the seafloor of Enceladus. Uh, there are indications from tiny nanograins of silica that could only form in very warm water, water close to the boiling point, uh, indicating that there, uh, the possibility of hydrothermal vents. And those hydrothermal vents are important because now they're providing a source of energy inside this global ocean on Enceladus. That global ocean appears to be slightly thicker at the South Pole. And we know from looking at hydrothermal vents on the Earth that we find basically uh, civil, you know, all kinds of interesting life, crabs, tube worm, tube worms, et cetera, uh, tiny eyeless creatures down there, the blind creatures that are just around like little islands of life around the hydrothermal vents on the seafloor of the Earth. And, and so we wonder, you know, what about Enceladus? Could there possibly be uh, life in the ocean of Enceladus. You're able to sample the grains and the material coming from Enceladus, but in Cassini's velocities, the impacts of the particles and the gas molecules were large enough to have broken apart anything. Uh, and we, perhaps we we're seeing fragments by looking at these uh, hydrocarbons. So for Enceladus, the icy jets on Enceladus were one of the key discoveries by Cassini, evidence of a global subsurface ocean hydrothermal chemistry and that strong thermal anomaly it's warmer at the south pole as that water is coming out measured the plume composition and the connection to the jets and curtains perhaps along the tiger stripes there may be individual jets as well as curtains of material and actually found and we've been studying this in more detail as the cassini mission has ended that there's a modulation by tidal forces that enceladus's orbit is not quite uh, perfectly circular, and as it moves about in its orbit, uh, the amount of material coming out seems to be modulated by that orbit of Enceladus, by looking at Enceladus at different uh, parts of its orbit. And we actually saw stochastic on-off timing. Sometimes a jet would turn off, sometimes we'd see another jet uh, turn on. So a very intriguing and interesting world. And we'd like to put together a mission uh, with instruments that could measure and look for very complex organics, uh, look for evidence of fatty acids uh, to go back to Enceladus at some point. Finally, in conclusion, those final 22 orbits, uh, grand finale and Cassini's final goodbye. It turns out with that global liquid water ocean on Enceladus and actually a, a global ocean on Titan, although it's buried between quite a thick icy crust, that it, uh, with NASA planetary protection, it became important that once Cassini was running out of fuel, and that was happening toward the end of the mission, that we did not allow those radioisotope thermoelectric generators uh, with Cassini to impact, especially Enceladus. 
We didn't take any precautions to sterilize the Cassini spacecraft. And we know from studies of satellites in Earth orbit that sometimes viruses and it's amazing how long something can live in space. And so we wanted to be very careful not to provide contamination potentially from Earth, in particular to Saturn's moon Enceladus. And so we put together a, a series of orbits. They can see the grand finale orbits in blue. In order to achieve those orbits, we first had to get to what we called ring grazing orbits, pulling the periaps in as close to the rings as we were comfortable with. And then with a single Titan flyby, very close Titan flyby, to hop across all of the rings. And, and this was something we didn't know about when the Cassini mission was launched. And it was really a, a team of both of graduate students and postdocs and, and navigators from the Cassini mission as well at Purdue worked together over one summer and actually found there was a way to hop across the rings with a single jump. And then the final orbit, uh, we call it Titan's Goodbye Kiss. It was a distant Titan flyby, but it nudged Cassini in its orbit enough to put periaps into uh, the uh, at atmosphere of Saturn, and with that ended the Cassini mission. Intriguing data, though, in those final 22 orbits. You can see the cosmic dust analyzer, the little gray boxes, the samples that they made, and looking at some of what they discovered. Uh, we know that the ring particles move into the atmosphere. We think the rings were 99% water ice with some non-icy uh, contaminants. Found not only water ice, which is the primary primary constituent, but also silicates in this region as well. Uh, found that evidence for ring rain, the tiniest particles can become charged, actually follow, you can see the white line on the left, follow magnetic field lines into the atmosphere of Saturn and create what we call ring rain. Mm. Ion and neutral mass spectrometer, big surprise. We're still puzzling over this, that there are complex organics in the rings out to the limits of 100 mass units for the ion and neutral mass spectrometer. And uh, what we wonder is we know that the rings are bombarded by meteorites and by bits of comets and other things. And perhaps what we're seeing in these complex spectra are the residuals there from the impacts on the rings. What was most intriguing, we were worried about with Cassini that we might be impacted by a ring particle, typically on the size of millimeters to centimeters. But instead, in that gap in between the edge of the D ring and the top of the atmosphere, some process has essentially removed the majority of the water ice and the particles are down to tiny nanograins, too small to have harmed the Cassini spacecraft, fortunately, at the large velocities through which we are going through that gap. And so that was good news for the science, but left a very intriguing puzzle. We still don't know exactly what process could take ring particles on the order of millimeters to centimeters and basically within a very short space radially moving in towards Saturn, grind those particles up into nanograins about the size of smoke particles. Just some of the highlights discovered a new weak radiation belt in that region, the ring material falling in, a very interesting organic composition, uh, newly discovered currents that connect the rings, and the fact that the magnetic field axis is nearly aligned with the rotation axis. Mm. Also, we could measure the mass of the rings, that by diving between the planet and the rings themselves, we could make a direct measurement of the mass. The uncertainty of the mass was about 100%. Uh, we had five gravity passes to measure the total ring mass of these 22 orbits, and found that to our surprise, it was much smaller than we had been expecting. And if you use estimates of how fast the rings are eroded away from when they formed, points to a very young ring age, only on the order of 100 to 100 million years old. And what's tricky about that is if you look at uh, what's shown here in millions of years, uh, if, you, if they're you know, anywhere from 10 to 100 million years old, perhaps the rings formed at, at the time of the dinosaurs. And it's intriguing to think that perhaps Ooh. Saturn uh, may have gone through, you know, may perhaps Saturn and, and the other planets as well, may have ring systems that are transient, that perhaps exist for a time and decay away. And then perhaps an object gets too close to Saturn, a moon moves in too close, tidal forces tear it apart, and you get another ring system. So it's intriguing to think about that we are in a period of time, you know, Saturn's rings are eroding away. There are estimates from more recent papers that perhaps in another 100 to 300 million years, perhaps Saturn's rings might be gone. So we just have this window 
where we see very bright rings at Saturn. Turns out Jupiter has a very faint ring. It's supported primarily by sputtering from its tiny inner moons. Uranus and Neptune also have ring systems, but they're not as spectacular and, and massive as the ring system at Saturn. So perhaps within our own solar system, we're seeing a variety of ring ages as you look at different planets in our solar system. Uh, very close images of the rings. What was most intriguing is that clumpy structure that we'd seen earlier in the mission actually had different kinds of character. And you can see very uh, your technical words here like streaky and clumpy and uh, no texture. And we're not sure what creates the, the boundaries between areas of no texture, for instance, and clumpy texture. So it's, it's very intriguing to think about. Again, could point to better understanding how material might clump together to actually form planets in our solar system. So more work is being done. We still don't understand this is a plateau in the C ring. What confines the edges of the plateau? We looked for tiny moons that perhaps could provide confinement. That's one mechanism. But in the, in the C ring, we did not find a single moon that would be capable of, or a large object that could confine these plateaus. So another mystery uh, left uh, for more modeling and study and a, a future mission. So the grand finale, uh, science crossing through the ring gap, uh, just highlights I've covered new radiation belt. The, the core is about 15 to 18 Earth masses. The atmosphere differentially rotates to a depth of about 9,000 kilometers. And this might be the boundary where the, the pressures are so great, you actually start to get sort of a, a fluid with the hydrogen compressed. Uh, but we, it was not expected that the rotation, differential rotation would go to that large depth. And this was from uh, the flybys through the gap of the planet, com almost completely aligned to within um, micro radians or milliradians, uh, the magnetic field and the spin axis, complex organics in, between, in this region between the rings and the planet. Uh, and newly detected currents. So lots of new science. Uh, papers were published in 2018 in Science uh, and just really intriguing, uh, basically like a new mission at this end of mission. Here are Cassini's final 90 seconds. What you're looking at the top is uh, station 43X band and 43S band. Uh, Cassini spacecraft struggled to hold and, and maintain a signal to the Earth. And once the atmospheric density got too high, then the antenna was moved away from the Earth, and that's what, here, here I'll go back and, and show that again. That, that signal, that primary signal of communication was lost first in X-band and then in S-band. And very quickly thereafter, the Cassini spacecraft would have been torn apart by the atmosphere and then vaporized in the atmosphere. And so it was a, a really a, you know, a, a moment, quite a sad moment uh, for, you know, tr tremendous mission, remarkable discoveries. Uh, but that instant watching that signal, I was sitting there in the back watching the signal, and it was really, uh, you know, Cassini family, it was really a, a big impact for that uh, group of people. And we were very proud and also, but just sad, like the loss of a friend. And this is the Cassini family saying goodbye. We all lined up on the steps outside of JPL. And I actually had my, uh, my daughters and my young granddaughter, Audrey, were actually there at JPL uh, with me as we are watching the end of the Cassini mission. And what an incredible mission. And with that, I just like to end. There are lots of videos if you're interested, including two documentary, a two-part documentary that re was released in 2021 called The Triumph at Saturn. You can access that on YouTube, a nice overview of the Cassini mission, and also some other uh, short videos as well. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Dr. Spilker, thank you for, it's amazing how much, how much came out of that mission. It's, it's, it's just tremendous. Oh, and it continues to come. Like I say, the modeling still continues and, and uh, Cassini data are now gonna be used to think about what we do at Uranus, but you're very welcome. It's, it was really a, a privilege to work on such an incredible mission. And please, everybody, you may unmute yourselves and I, we invite questions. Please. Uh, have we ever sent a space vehicle through one of the, you know, uh, the, the thick part of the ring to see what the effect would be? I know you missed it deliberately. 
but have we ever tried to do it? Uh, we haven't tried it, although it was in, uh, interesting in the early days, there was some thought of sending Pioneer through the Cassini division uh, and decided not to do that, which was a good thing because the Cassini division is empty right near the B ring, but it really contains material. We think that at the densities, especially in the B ring, that it would very quickly basically tear the spacecraft apart, uh, but the spacecraft would, would come back, those particles would come back and probably be further eroded away, that the material is dense enough. I mean, we were worried about very, very low optical depth material between the D-ring and the top of Saturn's atmosphere that we couldn't see in any of our images that it might damage the spacecraft. And so we actually used the high gain antenna as a shield for the very first orbit, uh, thinking that if the particles were too large, they'd hit the high gain antenna and we could perhaps continue that way. Or if the Cassini spacecraft had been damaged on that first orbit, the mission was set up in a way that we didn't need to do any more maneuvers. It would naturally have encountered Titan on the, the final orbit and gone into the planet. Uh, but we think it would be rather catastrophic. Although as a ring scientist, I must say, I am intrigued with this idea of a mission to perhaps uh, actually hover above the rings, maybe uh, mm -hmm. you know hundreds of meters or a kilometer and make movies of the ring particles mm -hmm. actually interacting. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's, a, that's a possibility, it's on the list. Uh, that we could use some kind of propulsion system, maybe ion propulsion to, to hover above and maybe move across the rings and actually study them. But I don't think we want to get too close. Uh, thank you. Do you have any examples where, where uh, a body would have pierced a ring plane and left a, a, a void, a transient mm. void maybe? Oh, good question. We did see evidence of um, meteoroids or micrometeoroids impacting the ring and creating a cloud of debris. And so it probably impacted a, you know, a particle larger than itself, uh, broke it apart, probably broke apart the parent body it impacted. And for a period of time, there's actually a cloud of debris that you could measure above and below the ring plane. And over time, you can imagine that those orbits are slightly different speeds and it slowly uh, dissipates and goes away. And it's really Saturn's oblateness. It's a very oblate planet that actually tends to push material very and keep it very close to the ring plane. But we did see impacts in Saturn's rings, yes. Do you have any insight mm -hmm. into what causes the six-sided symmetry at the North Pole? Why six instead of eight or 12 or circular? Oh, that's a great question have, first of all, why not circular? We're, we're not sure. It looks like it's probably, you know, better model as a sine wave and it just projects as a hexagon. But in some of the models and things they've done, atmospheric models, treating the atmosphere of Saturn as a fluid, they can get objects of all different sizes, five sides, six sides, you know, even larger than that. And they don't tend to be stable. They don't tend to be stable long-term, just, you know, taking these tanks of fluid and rotating them. So, why six sides? That, that's a really good question. That's right. <clears throat> Manny, uh, yeah, Manny. Jackie, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna ask on the, the tiger stripes, are they really blue or did you was that just colored an image? And yeah, there, that was, yeah, good color. That's a little bit of an enhancement of the image, enhanced in a way that smaller particles tend to look kind of bluish in the image, but it was really, you're right, it was enhanced or highlighted to bring out the tiger stripes. They would not look that blue uh, otherwise. And is your conclusion, I mean, there, there just seems to be so much um, organic material and carbon-based material. I mean, it, 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 you were kind of saying, and I just wanted to confirm that the likelihood of some kind of, uh, you know, a life and uh, is it must be possible under there with you know show and we saw on, in on earth the crabs and that sort of thing it, it just seems i would be shocked to think there wasn't some kind of life there yeah it, it's an interesting question because you have water mm -hmm. uh, in the enceladus ocean you have a source of heat with the hydrothermal vents or energy mm -hmm. uh, for life and then you have these uh organic material and we wonder you know perhaps what happened is some of those ice particles had say a bit of a little microbe of fatty acid and it just hit the target so hard that it was you know fracture all these little daughter products came out and fractured the larger 
organic molecules because we are going typically between seven and maybe as much as 14 kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty, pretty tough on any organic material. Amazing. Well, I think it'd be great to land on the surface and put out a little sample and collect it like snow and put it in your little, little lab and do some work on it and see what you find. Bring a microscope, see if there's anything moving. Mm -hmm. Robert Humphreys, you raised your uh, hand. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Spilker, I'm, this was such a fire hose of information, um, but I was really curious about what you were talking about, about what you think is the transient nature of this ring system. And so based on what you know and the, and the rings around the other gas um, planets, would you consider the other gas planet rings to be um, in a highly degenerated state then? That, that's one possibility. I can speak to Uranus. Uranus has you know, nine or 10 narrow rings in the system. Uh, if you look at high phase angle, there's a lot of dust in the system as well. Uh, and then the question is, you know, of course, how does a ring system form? And as that ring system ages, we know that the material is eroded away. Uh, it can fall into the planet. It can move out into space. Part of Saturn's uh, ring longevity could have to do with the fact that the outer edge of the B ring and the A ring are in resonances. So basically held in place, keeping the ring material really from leaking out very efficiently and holding those in place. There's really nothing to hold the inner boundaries in place, however. And so we're seeing erosion, you know, of the D ring, maybe it was brighter in the past and it's now down to, you know, it's probably be the first ring to disappear. And maybe over time you could imagine maybe the, the D ring disappears, the C ring, then the A ring would slowly go. And then maybe you're left with some structures uh, perhaps in the B ring, maybe the F ring will be around a while. It has uh, moons on either side, kind of like Uranus's epsilon ring that the moons are in a sense shepherding or keeping that material uh, there with the F ring, but it could be possible that you're seeing, uh, and then of course, Neptune is a little bit different. Uh, Triton is a captured object. It's in a retrograde orbit. Uh, it probably did wreak havoc with that system, uh, you know, probably destroying or gobbling up or, you know, impacting, you know, running into moons. And, and there's a very tenuous ring system left, probably supplied by material coming off of the, some of the smaller moons. But uh, Neptune's a little harder to understand, understand, you know, maybe if it did have a ring system, uh, Triton would have really disrupted it with its retrograde orbit. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. If I could, M Manny, Manny saw it, saw it. You had a, a rather long, complex question in the chat. You wanna turn on your microphone and ask it, please? Yeah, sure, thanks very much. Uh, let me just read it. Since there, there's a possibility of life under the ice of Enceladus, much like on Earth's ocean depths, why aren't there more effort on developing a mission to Enceladus? If we're looking for life outside the Earth, wouldn't Enceladus be the most likely place? Great question. Uh, it turns out that uh, NASA just completed a decadal survey. Uh, basically, it's recommendations, to getting community consensus on what we should do in the future. Uh, for flagship missions like Cassini, the first recommendation was to go to Uranus and carry a probe and have an orbiter at Uranus. And during that time, what we're trying to do is develop the instruments and the technology to go back. And so the second flagship of the decade would be something called an Enceladus Orbilander. It would be an orbiter that would orbit in the moon Enceladus for a period of time and make measurements and then take the entire spacecraft down to the surface land on Enceladus with the very capable instruments, essentially carry a little laboratory with you to make those measurements. So there are plans in place. Enceladus was viewed as a high priority. There are other ocean worlds. That's what Enceladus is called in our solar system. Enceladus is unique because it has so much material coming out that you could directly sample with an orbiter and land close to it, and you could collect very fresh material. Uh, Jupiter's moon Europa, it's much larger. It also has a global ocean. There's some thought that perhaps other moons in the Saturn system, maybe even the Iranian system, may have global oceans as well. Uh, so the, the, one of the big paradigm shifts, in, you know, in particular with Cassini, is that these ocean worlds, we knew Europa had an ocean, now we find Enceladus, uh, possibly Tethys and Dione, maybe Ariel at 
Uranus. Uh, we know Triton has geysers going off uh, in the Neptune system. Uh, so uh, it is intriguing to go and look at these worlds for life, although it probably would be you know, pretty basic life, microbial kind of life. Uh, what's equally intriguing is if we don't find life in a place where you give it the water, the energy, and the nutrients, that equally would be intriguing. So maybe there's another piece of the puzzle there. So not finding life would be equally astonishing as would finding life. But I agree. I think we should look in our own solar system. It's just a question of uh, priorities and looking across the science. I'm a big, big fan of going back to Enceladus. In fact, there's a program called New Frontiers in the New Frontiers 5 program. The Enceladus is part of that program, and I'm part of a team developing a proposal for New Frontiers 5 to go back to Enceladus and uh, try and answer some of these questions. It wouldn't be as big and, and uh, complex as a flagship, but it could certainly be a good first start and much sooner than a flagship toward the, the end of the 2030s. Other questions? Other questions? Okay, let, let me ask about the ring origin. Is the best model for the ring origin to think of captured materials that somehow bled off and were pulverized and formed the rings. And if that is, a, is the main consideration, is this just totally random and you get rings when you happen to run into particles or is there a larger synchronicity of ring generation with that method on the other gas giants? Well, there were two competing theories early on. This is the, going back to Voyager. One was that the rings formed at the time of the planets, that basically any material left inside the Roche limit could not come together and form a moon. And so you were left with rings around uh, the gas giant planets. And then the second idea was that perhaps a moon or a comet came in too close to the planet, tidally disrupted, and you form the ring system in that way. And if the rings are really only a 10 or 100 million years old, then clearly the 4 billion year old ring idea uh, isn't, isn't holding up. There just isn't enough mass there to have lasted uh, for, that, for that long. And so it could be a moon, a comet. Uh, one idea was perhaps after Saturn formed and there's still a gas disk around it, maybe there was an object about the size of Titan that had differentiated. Uh -oh. That object came in close to the planet and of course, the, the icy material on the outside would be torn off, but perhaps the rocky core would go on into Saturn. And that could perhaps explain the high ice content, that the Iranian rings are, are not as pristine and, and icy as Saturn's rings. So there are lots of ideas about what might form them, but they appear, at least in the case of Saturn, appear to be quite young. Yeah. But if the capture method may be the best explanation, is Saturn, like, does they have the ideal mass or location that would make it more able to form these rings rather than Ju the massive Jupiter, for example? Not necessarily. No, no, it's not sitting close to the asteroid belt. It's not in a favorable place relative to the where the comets might go. So it would just be, you know, sort of the luck that, the, that whatever the process was that formed Saturn's rings just happened to happen about you know, 10 or 100 million years ago. Hmm. Nothing special that we know of about the location of Saturn in our own solar system. Oh, thank you. In the chat, Robert Baker asked, did, did you get any images? Were you able to image anything at the bottom of the hurricane at the North Pole? With the images, you know, there, there's basic, we did not really penetrate very deeply with the images. I think our best, uh, as far as getting actually to able to see what is deep down inside the hurricane, no, no. We got the best measurements, I think, in the near infrared and far infrared, and actually telling you at what pressure level and how deeply that you could see into the hurricane. Although that black region in the near infrared, it, it just says it's it's deep. It doesn't tell you exactly how deep it would be. Other questions? Please turn on your microphones. Um, let me ask then. Um, 
over over the I guess what twenty years that Cassini was in in space, what challenges did you face with the spacecraft? Well, I've got to say, with Cassini, we were really uh, pretty lucky that way. We did not have any major failures. We had uh, some parts of instruments, you know, stopped working as time went on. One of the magnetometers, for instance, uh, stopped working. Uh, we had times when perhaps their a command would be corrupted and wouldn't get up correctly. And there was a lot of fault protection built into the spacecraft. It's basically, if something didn't get through correctly, then the spacecraft would go into what we called safe mode, which it would basically stop taking science data, stop moving around, and just kind of curl up and say, help, help and go to a very low data rate so we could communicate with it and we could then get back diagnostic data, engineering data, figure out what was wrong, kind of uh, put it back onto its sequence. And that that didn't happen uh, very many times. So uh, Cassini was uh, in the major computers and the major subsystems was fully redundant. Uh, and we really didn't have to go into that redundancy too far. We did switch to the backup thrusters. We'd put a lot of wear and tear on our first set of thrusters and switch some of those. Uh, but in general, I mean, we, we, we were planning for, you know, if we had something go wrong and it lasted long enough, we might miss a maneuver. Say we miss a maneuver that lines us up to fly by Titan. So we were talking about what we would do if we would fall off the tour and have to get back onto a very carefully choreographed set of orbits. Uh, but we never fell off the tour. And so uh, that actually allowed us to extend the mission for as long as we did. We got creative toward the end of the mission in being able to use very little Delta V and actually get that last set of years, you know, seven years or so to last all the way out until solstice. Remar a remarkable piece of engineering. Wow. Jim. Jim Nordhausen, you had a question in the chat. Do you want to turn on your microphone and ask it? Sure, I was just uh, wondering what you thought about the potential upcoming YIELS mission being developed to go down the cracks and sample the ocean from Enceladus. Oh, I think that's a great, uh, the YIELS instrument you're talking about. Yeah, there's an instrument being developed. It's a set of con uh, counter rotating disks. Looks kind of like a snake. And the thought would be that you would carry an instrument like this to Enceladus and could perhaps go down one of those, one of those uh, fractures, you know, where the jet's coming out and perhaps reach the ocean. And so uh, I actually am helping advise the EELS team a little bit. And that's an incredible mission. You could act to actually go down to the ocean, get in there and directly sample the ocean itself would be really an intriguing mission. And, and perhaps, uh, that might be an instrument considered for the Orbilander mission. Once you're going to land, if you feel safe enough to land close to a tiger stripe, that certainly would be the way to go. There's another mission going back to the Saturn system called Dragonfly. Uh, Dragonfly is going to actually land on the surface of Titan. It's a quadcopter, a Titan's atmosphere. Wow. It's uh, four times as dense as the Earth's. You know, if you had wings big enough with Titan's gravity and thick atmosphere, you could probably fly. So it's a great place for a quadcopter to land on a place on Titan, make measurements directly on the surface. And uh, the way it's set up is, you know, you land at a place and then you take off and you sort of scout ahead. Maybe you look for the next couple of places to land, then you come back, recharge your, you know, you, they, it's got actually an RTG on it. And uh, then you come back and then sort of hop ahead, planning ahead where you would go. It's gonna land in the equatorial region, so not near any of the lakes at the North Pole of Titan, but that mission is funded. Uh, I'm not sure, I think the launch date is in the mid, I think it's probably four or five years away, uh, but that would be an intriguing mission. Other things, Don, Donald Lind, you had a question about pointing and control. You still? Yeah, yeah, I, I see that question in the chat. It turns out that uh, Voyager had a scan platform and that was really nice because you could point the high gain antenna at earth and then just move the platform around and look at targets. In the case of Cassini, we experienced early in the mission, a large budget cut. And one of the, what we decided we wanted to try and keep all the science instruments. And so instead we took the moving parts off the spacecraft including a scan platform for the optical remote sensing instruments. And there's actually a turntable initially 
for the fields and particles instruments so they could get their full 360 degree coverage. So instead, we just placed all of the instruments on board on the spacecraft. Uh, and so we then had to turn the entire spacecraft, uh, which was much slower process. Uh, we had all of the remote sensing instruments co-bore sighted, so you could look at the same target at the same time, but it involved, and we used reaction wheels. What we would do is we would use reaction wheels to turn the spacecraft, point at the various targets, spend about 16 hours a day collecting data, and then have to turn back and put the high gain antenna on the earth while we played back the data that were on our solid state recorders. And uh, then once the reaction, sometimes the reaction was you'd have to unload the momentum and we would do that with thrusters. And so that, but reaction wheels were what we used to point and turn the spacecraft. Anybody else? Anybody else? We are getting, we are getting along. We're almost an hour and a half Fascinating. into the, uh, end of the meeting. And uh, Dr. Spilker, you've been very gracious with your time. Thank you very much. Um, You're very welcome. I guess I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to conclude with a question if I might. Um, I, I, I ran across one interview that you had. And in that interview, you are quoted as saying that Cassini is a very dedicated spacecraft. I think of Cassini as a she with a nickname Cassie. Could you tell us specifically, maybe not too specifically, but could you tell us the, the attributes or characteristics <laughs> of the spacecraft that lets you assign the female gender to it? Oh, I yeah, yeah. I think uh, part of it is maybe in seeing Cassini as a reflection of, of myself, you know, it would really be, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm out there with Cassini and an explorer there. And also I think about, the, you know, the sailing ships of old were all named after, you know, women and uh, just with Cassini, just the persistence and, and the, the effort that went into it just to, to me, because Cassini felt like a she, but I'm sure in part it's a reflection of, of, of my set, you know, what I, I think about. And also it was in, interesting. There were a lot of women working on Cassini. If I compare my Voyager experience to my Cassini experience on Voyager, most of the scientists were men uh, and, and most of the people running at the upper level of the mission were men. I mean, that's just how it was in those days. In fact, they were white men. You know, if you look at it, the science teams were male. Uh, I worked with a team uh, in my role and I said, the only woman that would go to the meetings and I'd come with my little agenda and I'd help the scientists figure out what they wanted to do, but they were very gracious. And so I didn't feel like that was a problem, but it was years later, I looked back and I said, you know, for, for decades, I was the only woman at the meeting. But with Cassini, if you look at it, we had a project manager, Earl Mays, but then I was the project scientist. Julie Webster was the head of the spacecraft team and Catherine Weld was the head of the operations team. And I think, uh, and then we had actually Alice Wesson, the head of our outreach group. So we had a lot of women. And so it just felt like we had sort of the feminine touch on Cassini and really kept a good eye on her. Well, that's a wonderful answer. And, and thank you very much. Um, it has been a wonderful discussion, a wonderful presentation. Dr. Spilker, I appreciate you being here. Um, Again, we need to we need to bring the meeting to a conclusion. So let me let me end with a word about our next our next session. The Greenway Talks will continue <clears throat> on Saturday, June eighteenth, when astrophysicist Dr. Shelley Wright, associate professor in physics at UC San Diego and principal investigator of the UC SD Optical and Infrared Laboratory will speak with us about a new all sky survey program, the Pulsed All Sky Near Infrared Optical SETI, which we call PanoSETI <clears throat> Observatory, will use two unique telescopes to continuously watch the night sky for optical and infrared signals produced 
by alien civilizations in our galaxy and beyond. And that's on June 18th. So again, thank you to Dr. Linda Spilker. And my thanks as well to everybody who attended. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. And thank you for supporting the Greenway Talks online. With that- Thank you, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody wave. <laughs> That's wonderful. And we'll see you on June 18th. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Great.